this beautiful day. The sun has made its first appearance in like a year. Thank you, Lord. Oh, ah. you know, we have uh, three dogs running around the house and every time they come in, it's like a mud fest. You guys ever do see those tough mudders? That's what they look like when they come in. Three, because we're watching. So uh, thanks and praise be to our worship team and our worship leaders are in Colorado. A shout out to you if you are watching. Um, as they went out to visit some friends this weekend. Um, if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We'll get one to you. Caitlin, you're funny. Um, and of course, our just our usual announcements. Monday, if you're in town and you can be around, please join us for our discipleship group. We meet at 34 Laurel Hill Drive. Men and women, come learn how to study your Bible. Now, as you know, we are... In trying to reach those who don't live in the area, we do Facebook Live it. Um, I do know that we're going to have to work on passing the iPad around so that when people respond or ask questions, you can hear because it kind of becomes uh, hard to hear when the iPad isn't moving. So we're working on improving that. But if you can't make it because you live far away, now far away means you live in another state. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I take that back. Two states away, because we do have someone that lives in Philly that does come out to group. So two states away. Then you get the pass. You can use the live. But otherwise, hey, no need to hide. Come out. Learn how to study your Bibles. Learn how to read it. Let me help you with that. It's just a joy and a pleasure to do it. You know, it was really cool. Uh, I had breakfast this week with a guy that came out for the first time. And it was really, really just awesome to hear him say, Jim, I'm so hungry. I just want to learn. Just teach me. I'm like, man, there is a Matthew 5 Christian who hungers and thirsts for righteousness sake. So let his example be one to all of us. Let us hunger and thirst for these things. Listen, tomorrow's not guaranteed. So if it's your last day here on earth, don't you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, instead of just, you're done, right? Study with us. Learn together with us. So we will tune it in live. You can join us. Um, and, you know, we do our morning devotions now, Monday through Friday, thanks to the push of some in the church. They're like, hey, I don't mean to stress you out. I know it's another thing on your plate, Jimbo, because, you know, we don't say Pastor Jim. It's just Jimbo. But can you do a, and, but I've just watched, you know, this family grow even online. So if you're up at eight o'clock in the morning or you just want to tune in later, it's another way to share. It's just usually one point in the devotion and we hammer that point home and just gives us something for the day. But even with that, study yourself to make sure that what I say is true. We are in first John uh, chapter four. If you will turn your Bibles with me. If you have a notebook or there's a few left bulletins left, you're going to want to probably take some notes today. It's going to have a different feel because I want to attempt to take you into the mind of a false teacher. I want to try to get you into the brain and heart of a cult mindset. So... I'm going to have a list. Now, if you just want to listen and go re-listen to the message as many times and go back and take your own notes, that's fine. If you want a copy of my notes, I will get you some. But we're revisiting something that was started in 1 John chapter 2. And throughout much of the Bible, there's warnings about false teachers. How do you know I'm not one? Uh, uh, uh. Jim, because you wear the cool t-shirts. You can't be a false teacher, dude. This is my cell. That's how I, that's my hook, and we'll get into that today. How do you know? If you go to another church, how do you know that they're not lying to your face? Listen, because they stand up here? Because they wear a fancy robe? 
Why? Because they say they know. Careful, that's where we're going to go today. So, we're in 1 John chapter 4. Please, I need you to f try to your best to follow along. But I am going to ask you, we are going to turn to probably several different places as we visit. So I'll give you the addresses on spot, except for the two, because to start our message, we are going to refer to two that launches us into our study. So if you would take your Bibles and thumb mark them at Romans chapter 16. It's going to be verses 17 and 18. That's Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. And then the book before it is the book of Acts chapter 17. We're going to refer to the first three verses. So again, it's Acts chapter 17 and Romans chapter 16. But as we... Move through the study. I'm going to make scripture references. I don't expect you to turn there, but I'm going to use them as illustrations because you have to see how nasty these teachers are, how good they are, how clever they are. You may not be able to spot one on, on right there when it happens, but I'm going to teach you to have a trained eye. And for you youth who are thinking about college, you're going to be prey. Trust me, here comes some fresh born-again meat. They're going to try to lead you astray, indoctrinate you with all kinds of nasty pollution, spiritually speaking. And you know what I say? Bring them to me. Bring them to me. No, as your shepherd, as long as you call me your pastor, this is the one time you can call me pastor. Pastor. Because I protect my sheep. I protect my sheep. And like the Marines have a saying, or even in maybe some of the other forces, we protect against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Sadly, in the church, you have some enemies. So, it's really important that we take a look at this. So let's pray and let's go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our study. Father, thank You that we can gather publicly and freely is still in your name. Lord, we're not underground. Lord, we're not fleeing from one city to the next. Lord, none of us can probably really imagine what that would be like to have to actually just take our clothes on our back and run to another city just to live. So we give you thanks for the freedom and those that provide it for us, Lord. Thank you, God, that we have your words to study as there are so many who don't have it. Would you give us a deeper desire to know you? Father, would you convict us of the laziness and the contentness and the comfortableness that we often sit in where TV shows, movies, creatures of habit want to just remain instead of constantly be in the grand pursuit of you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word again. It's so perfect and holy. And we trust you to convict us and change us. Please, Lord, make us more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John chapter 4. We're only going to do the first six verses. The title of the message is Pinpointing the Problem. Pinpointing the Problem. Let's read the first Six verses together. Again, it's the first epistle to John, chapter 4. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now, is now, I should say, already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he, 
who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John, once again, as I had mentioned earlier, is revisiting 1 John chapter 2 where he talked about how do you know if you're really saved? How do you know, family, and those that are listening online, how do you know you're going to heaven? So many abide under this, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. How do you know? John is going to tell us, in order to find out, listen carefully, verse 1, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe one single person. You need to test the spirit. The word test, if you circle that word, it means to examine, to scrutinize, to prove to be genuine. That's your job. And it's my job to not believe what anybody says, but to measure it by this. But not just by this, by this accurately. It's our job to test everyone. But I need to ask you and I a question. When was the last time you gave a test to someone? You're out in the supermarket. I'm eating, picking up my cinnamon toast crunch, and I shouldn't be. I can't help it. That just It's like, that's the one thing that trips me up, cinnamon toast crunch. Okay, I have more. Thanks, honey. But then a conversation starts. Oh, you like cinnamon toast crunch, too. Here we go. <laughs> Nobody likes to go anywhere with me. So... Do you know Jesus? See the shirt? Hey, look. Better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. They now have a cereal that's based off Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Lord have mercy on my soul. When was the last time you gave the test? You see, in verse 1, the first point of my three-point outline is it's called spiritual troubleshooters. Listen to the definition of a troubleshooter. It's defined as a person who's skilled at solving or anticipating problems or difficulties. Or it's defined as a skilled worker who's employed to locate trouble and then make the necessary repairs typically found in machinery and technical equipment. You and I, if we really are saved, we are the spiritual troubleshooters. You and I should be skilled to be able to talk to another brother or another sister and pinpoint where things might not be quite right. But my first question to you is, do you want to be one to administer the test? Already I see, uh, Jim, no. <laughs> Why not? The best part about teaching is it holds you accountable. It does. That's why I love what I do. It keeps me honest. It keeps me safe. Because i got to tell you what to do according to Scripture, but then I better be living it. But you and I, we're supposed to be these spiritual troubleshooters to be able to identify who's a real believer and who's not. When does that usually happen? It usually doesn't happen in the church. Think about it. You all come, hug, greet, shake one hand, whatever, right? We worship, get our word on, and then poof, out the door we go. So you're not sh troubleshooting in here, which tells us we should be troubleshooting out there. Practically speaking, what does that look like? I asked you to turn to Acts 17. If you would turn there with me and listen and or listen carefully. 
learn a lesson of how Paul troubleshoots. Just simply in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 17, it says, Now when they had passed through, I can't even say the name of the town, Amphipolis and Apollony, they came to Thessalonica. This is eventually where Paul would plant the church in Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, he went into them. For three Sabbaths, circle, he reasoned. Circle that word because it means to dialogue. He had conversations with them. From the scriptures, verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And notice verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. And there was a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women who joined Paul and Silas. Your attention, please. Paul was a great troubleshooter, and he shows us how to do it. He talks to people. Dialogue. Everyone, point to your mouth. You got one, right? Are you using it? Why would I do that? Why would I talk about my faith? Why wouldn't you talk about your faith? Well, Jim, I don't know anything about my faith. I can help you with that. Well, Jim, I, they'll never listen to me. Why do we say that? They're not going to listen to me. If you have a mouth, they have to listen to you. They don't have to do what you tell them, but they do have to listen. Unless you're one of those people when the guy turns his back, are you chasing after him? Yo, come here. Up, 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 and keep going. No. But he dialogued. And he reasoned. My fear and concern, family, and for the church, is this just something that we don't often and, sh and don't do anymore. Oh, Christianity is very personal to me. I keep it all to myself. No, we're supposed to be the opposite. But more importantly, if we really, really care about the lost world that's around us. Listen, you can't leave it up to PJ up here, Pastor Jim, to do it all. You know people that you can talk to those people that I can't. You have a circle of influence that I don't. Bring them to me. If you're afraid to talk, say, yo, come talk to Pastor Jim. I don't want to talk to a pastor. You'll start to have a conversation right there. Why don't you want to talk to my pastor about what you believe? Because you might be wrong. Because you might have been taught the wrong thing. Because you might not be a believer. And guess what? Now you're having a conversation that God wanted you to have. Does that make sense? Now, the other reason we should be troubleshooters is because if we care about one another, turn to Romans chapter 16. As part as caring for the sheep, looking out for the sheep, listen, you know I got your back. You know that, right? In verse 17, this is why I got your back. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. By smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You know why I got your back? Because I know some of you are young in your faith, don't know much about your faith, and I am not going to let some smooth talker snatch you away. It says brethren, plural. This is you and I. This is our job is to make sure that we warn everyone about someone that you find out does not teach the absolute truth. Do you follow me so far? Now listen. It may offend some. Well, Jim, you can't judge that teacher. 
Oh, really? So when Jesus says, when you judge to use righteous judgment, you know how I judge you? By what you say. By what you say. It may come down to what you do. Listen. Pastors are wilding out. Affairs all over the place. Corruption all over the place. Am I going to judge that? You better believe it. What are you doing, pastor? You're going to tell your sheep not to sleep around, but then you go and do it? You're going to tell your, these people keep tithing so you can just steal from them? Sadly, more than I'd like to share, it happens too much. So yes, if you do those kind of things, but I hear, I, listen, what you listen to matters to me, your pastor. So when we get now into part two, because it says to mark them, note them, tell people that person, false teacher, because here's what they said, and they haven't repented of it. If someone teaches something that's false, guess what? They have a chance to repent. You go to them and say, this is what you taught, but my scripture says otherwise. Are you going to repent? If they say no, then you tell everyone you have a false teacher in your midst. But you know what? It doesn't happen. You know what happens? As soon as the pastor hears you're going to tell people, they kick you out of the church. You're not welcome here anymore. Why? Because the pastor's going to get exposed. You better expose me. There are the small areas of Scripture where we can agree to disagree. God bless you. We, what the areas where I don't major on the minors, okay? So if you believe that the rapture is not going to happen, okay, fine. But when it comes to, are you going to heaven? What makes you saved? And how I live my life as a Christian, if it's contrary, or there's something as an error, you and I need to have a discussion, a dialogue. Let's reason together. But we got to do it using this and doing it right. Now, many of you I know are, most of you, if not all of you, are probably, I assume, saved. And you've probably heard countless teachings on false teachers of all sorts. But what I want to do for you, listen, because when you encounter someone that subscribes to a false teacher, they go to their church or their dwelling, whatever you want to call it. Or if you talk to someone that they themselves are teaching things that are in error. I want to give you a list of ways to get into their mind to see where they're possibly coming from. You see, here's what has been said by so many, right? Oh, Jim, if I just study my, the real thing, I'll be able to identify a false teacher. The problem is, are we studying this? <laughs> now, I get it. You guys have lives, you have work, you have hobbies. But when I say discipleship group, come learn to study your Bible, I do note who's there and who's not. Are you able to counter a false teacher and a cult leader? Are you able to lead them from where they stand in their position of being completely wrong? Are you able to take the scriptures and lead them to where it's right? Are you able to break down in the Bible the context? Some of you are like, oh gosh, I'm already lost. This is already not my thing. Jim, I'm not there. Can I have your eyes up here? Please, every eye up here. Then why won't you let me help you get there? Why do you continue to remain in the bubble that you live instead of come and learn? You could be used by God to deliver people under the bondage of cults and false teachers. If you don't think they exist, by the time we're done, I will have offended someone. There's a study, you can Google it, ready? It's called Apologetics. It's the defense of your faith. If you look up on your website, Apologetics Index, listen, you're going to see from A to Z how many cults and false teachings are really out there. You're going to vomit. When you see how nasty this stuff gets. How about this? Worse yet, the, they have followers. 
Why do they have followers? Because no one took the time to learn and study how to defend against it. And I've had more than one conversation with someone who says, Jim, I was a Christian, but now Jehovah's Witness is my thing. Jim, I'm a Muslim now. Jim, I'm a Buddhist now. Jim, I'm an atheist. Well, what happened? If you were really born again, according to what we're going to study, you would have ended up there. But the problem is, you didn't study, you didn't learn, you didn't get plugged in. Maybe it wasn't provided for you. But you that are going to college, wait till you get to philosophy. And their biology and the chemistry, and they start jamming down your throat this stinking evolution. I mean evolution. Are you going to be able to counter it? Can you go to Genesis and talk about the creation? Can you defend from Job that there are dinosaurs in the Bible? Do you know there was an article printed they found man's footprints inside dinosaur footprints? When the evolutionists showed up to that scene, they turned their backs because they knew they were in trouble. How did that happen? A dinosaur footprint and a man footprint in one thing. How did that get there? I know. The Christians put their foot in there. See, we're right. No. This is the truth that they're lying to you about. Because they want to keep you in the darkness. And I'm very passionate about bringing this out into the light. So if you're a note taker, listen, we're going to go through them at a fairly quick pace. This is how a false teacher, a false believer, and listen, I'll even give credit because get it, I get it. Maybe you come from a Seventh-day Advent perspective or a Catholic background and you have certain beliefs that you think a Christian still needs to worship on a specific day, you still need to eat a dietary law, like things like that, with all due respect, you're wrong, but we'll show you why from the Scriptures, because the New Testament is abundantly clear on these things. So it could be a simple matter of, hey, I really do love Jesus, I just live in legalism and some wrong ways. But it's still a false teaching nonetheless. You shouldn't have to do those things. So we're going to discuss them as we move in. So here we go. I have a list for you, and I just want you, to, again, to take notes or pay close attention. Inaccurate quotation. Here are ways that things get twisted. Number one is an inaccurate quotation. <laughs> this is when somebody quotes a Bible text, but it's not quoted the way it appears in the text, or it's wrongly placed. So there was a false teacher who said this, Jesus Christ said, be still and know that I am God. No, Christ never said that. That's in the Psalms. But if you don't know that, you might believe it. I was witnessing to a Jew, said he was a Jew, I think he was more atheist, and he goes, Jim, <laughs> I asked him, do you read your Old Testament? Oh yeah, it was Moses on the ark. I got my Old Testament down pat. I said, what? Who was on the ark? Moses. All right, next conversation. <clears throat> Twisted translation. Here we go. I only read King James. <laughs> King James is not the only accurate version of the Bible. But when you talk to Jehovah's Witness, they have their own specific version. And then they love to tell you that they have the best and most accurate. Ready? I had a Jehovah's Witness say it was on Jeopardy. Alex Trebek testified that the Jehovah's Witness Bible is the most accurate Bible there is. Who paid that man? Do you know the starting founding father of Jehovah's Witness was put on court he sat on a stand and told the world he understood biblical Greek. And then when they showed him the Greek alphabet, he didn't know it. That might have been actually the founder of Mormons, too, and or him. But these guys, they don't know. But then they tell you they got the best Greek translation. Are you nuts? I was on a plane ride. Again, simple example. Jehovah's Witness told me the word for heaven in the New Testament means government. 
She didn't know who she was sitting next to. I said, really? You think it means government? So when I flipped to the passage about that Paul was caught up to the third heavens, what government is that? She goes, where's that? You don't have the most accurate translation, man, with all due respect. Number three, the biblical hook. There's a text of Scripture that's quoted primarily as a device that grasps the attention of the, lead, the listeners and the readers, but then they don't go on to explain anything really about the text. They go off on their own personal tangent. An example of this in the Mormon faith, James chapter 1, verse 5, says, talks about asking for wisdom. Well, the Mormons will take that Scripture and then conclude that Joseph Smith was given a revelation because he asked for wisdom and he concluded a lot of wrong things like God the Father has a body. God is spirit. But he took a scripture to hook his audience in so that they would believe what he says and then I'll teach you the Mormon faith. That's how Jehovah's Witness and cults and so many work. They'll give you a scripture, but they won't really break it down. Not like we do here. Not like I teach you to do. Which leads to the next point. Number four, here's how cults twist and false teachers work. They ignore the immediate context. Oh my goodness. Here's the danger of topical teachers. If you've been to a church where one day you come in, and they're in this section, and the next day they're in this section, the next day they're over here and over there. It's like a windshield wiper. How does anyone connect anything? How do you know he's not, or sadly she's not, taking something out of context? Remember the rule of thumb when I teach you how to study your Bibles. you got to look at what's before, and you got to look at what's after, because it's going to determine what is really being said. But these people love to pull a quote, and run a mile with it. And they ignore and break every rule of how to really interpret it. Number five, collapsing contexts. This is when people cross-reference to support their position. But they do it in error. Can everyone please go with me to 3 John? We're in 1 John. Flip over about two pages to 3 John. Right now, please. It's just literally like two pages because 3 John is only one chapter. And look in verse 2. Third John, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. You see that? Everyone see it. Raise your hand if you don't see it. Javine, are you still there? You got it? I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Okay? While you hold your pinky there, go to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. I want to show you something. Old Testament. It's after Deuteronomy. Joshua, chapter 1. Hold the phone. I'm holding. Everyone there? Joshua, after Deuteronomy, it's just chapter 1, it's going to be verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Folks, this is how these people work. They're going to take those two verses and say, guess what? You should always prosper. One of the most disgusting teachings in the church today is they tell people you should always be healthy and wealthy. They took two scriptures and combined them together. You know what it's like? What happens when you mix oil with water? Uh. But we do it with scriptures, and people believe it. Why? Because I'm the guy up here teaching you? How many have fallen prey to this? Listen, who doesn't want the Disney World Christianity, where I, everything I get? This is the most wonderful place on earth. 
God's going to line my pocket so full. And you'll never be sick? Come to Children's Hospital with me. Come spend some time there. They don't change what you really think and believe. Don't tell me this nonsense. Some of the biggest TV evangelists and preachers in our nation today thrive under this kind of ministry. And people don't like when I say it. Why? This is what they're teaching. It's my job to mark them. It's my job to tell you that you need to tell others, hey, what they teach is not true. There is a context that needs to be determined in these verses. And I can help you do that if you don't know it. Next one, the figurative fallacy. Ready? Here's what the teachers are going to tell you. Oh, you, you don't take the Bible literally, do you? What is it, a picture story? Like pop-ups? <laughs> when I look at Jesus riding on a donkey, I see this hologram of a... Come on! The rule is you always take it literally until you can rule out that it's not literal. I had a guy tell me, because he wanted to remain in the homosexual lifestyle, that the fruit that he ate, that she ate, I'm sorry, Eve ate in the garden, it was, oh, they wanted to have sex. What? What did you get? Well, it's not literal, Jim, it's figurative. Isaiah 29, you don't have to turn there, verse 4 says, Thou shall be brought down and speak out of the ground. I know that verse may not make any sense to you. Thou shall be brought down and speak out of the ground. The Mormons will say, you see, this is where the Book of Mormon was taken out of the ground at the hill of Cumorah. I know you, the illustration, you may not be familiar with Mormon theology, but they took a verse and they made it figurative, and as a result, it provides the teaching to the Mormons. Because it's not figurative, it's literal, and if you look at the context, you'll establish it. Here we go, next one. Speculative readings of predictive prophecy. In Ezekiel 37, it talks about the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph the Mormons will take that to say, hey, this is where we get the Book of Mormon from. Because the prophecy, they falsely interpret. Be careful. Prophecy is not always easy to follow. Speculative readings of, you could just say, speculative prophecy. How about this one? Saying, but not citing. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> you know how many times I've been in a conversation? Yo, the Bible says this. <laughs> Okay. Chapter and verse, please. Chapter and verse. What did you just say? God helps those who help themselves? That's not in my Bible. What translation do you have? The Jim Lowenstein Bible? Oh, I know it says it somewhere. And then I'll be like, oh, <laughs> this is why I carry my Bible. Here, find it for me. Oh, I'm in a hurry. Of course you are. You were so ready to tell me about your poison and your theology, but now you've got to go. How convenient. Almost done. Esoteric interpretation. Esoteric is a fancy word for meaning that a few people are exclusively given divine revelation. So it'll sound like this. God told me. I have like seizures when I hear that. Eddie, Mary Baker Eddy, because she believes she was told this divine revelation says that the prayer that starts out, Our Father who's in, and Our Father who art in heaven, she translates that as Our Father, Mother God, all harmonious. Because that's what God told me. He revealed it to me. You know how many religions were started because God shows up as an angel, a dream, and this and that? 
It goes on and on. Listen, we have recent teachings, and I'm jumping a little ahead to my last point, but I'll just bring it up now. There is a theology going around. Black Israelites. The guy said that he had a visit in his dream from the angel Gabriel. Listen, no, you didn't. And it starts this whole line of thinking. And listen, if you're black African American, they'll prey on you because he'll appeal to the, what has happened to your people, if you will, in the past several hundred years to draw you in. You are a slave. Christianity is the white man's religion. That's why you need to follow us. Careful. You know how many people get sucked into that? Because they want to identify with a brother or sister in a militant fashion instead of the love of Christ, which says we're no longer white or black, Greek or Jew, all are one in Christ. Next fallacy is supplementing biblical authority. This is when people like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons will say, hey, our watchtower, our Book of Mormon, it's equal to Scripture. No, it's not. But that's what they'll use. Talk to a Jehovah's Witness. They, they love to go to their books and their materials because that's what they're brainwashed to do. Sad to say. They haven't learned to teach within the context and confines of Scripture. We're almost done. Two more. Rejecting biblical authority. You know how many times I've heard, hey, Jim, the Bible's written by men. There's no authority. <laughs> how many people wrote the Bible? Does anyone know? How many authors? That's your homework. Find out how many people wrote the Bible that were used. Well, God is the author because all scripture is God breathed by him. But he used men to pen it. Except for the Ten Commandments, that's the only thing God literally wrote with his fingers. 66 books over a thousand years, but yet it all makes complete sense. Come on now. Last one. Worldview confusion. I read self-interpretation. Oh my goodness. The Bible means this to me. I know you mean well. You're, I, but it doesn't fly. Sorry, there, I don't apologize for this, but you're wrong. There is generally one interpretation for the scriptures. There's infinite application. That's why you can read one verse today, the same verse tomorrow, the same verse the next day, and each time God will say something new to you about it. There's infinite application, but it had original author, original intent, an original audience, and if you don't know them, then don't tell me you know what it means. Listen, I'm a really, really, really dumb guy. I don't know much about anything. I just started cooking eggs really this year. Okay? Just saying. You give me a hammer and I do this with it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not good at much. I'm not really, I'm not. But when you try to play spiritual games with your Bible with me, <laughs> it's not going to work. Just not. Where we can disagree, we can. There are those limited areas that are called non-essentials. You know, if you want to be a vegetarian and you want to support your vegetarian because you're convicted by living the, the Old Testament Levitical lifestyle of where the law comes to eat only certain things, listen, I respect that. If you believe that you're going to go through the Great Tribulation, man, I feel sorry for you. Have fun. But when it comes to the rest, we need to really work it out together. We need to dialogue. We need to reason together. And listen, I'm an open man. I'm not going to just shut you down. Oh, you know, some people, oh, I got to go talk to Jim. Oh, I welcome these conversations. I live for them. I love them. Tell me what you believe and why you believe it and support it in the context and we're good. Then I don't got to worry about you.
All of these are ways in which the mindset of false teachers work, and you have to be able to troubleshoot them. You have to see, because listen, sometimes it's not enough when you're talking to someone to say, hey, listen, okay, we're buttonheads on the scripture. Go deeper. See if they're in one of these camps, if they struggle with one of these symptoms and say, hey, let's look at the context. Did you look at the verses before and after? Hey, let's look at who taught you. Did you learn it from someone? Listen, bad behavior in churches, is, it's, it's everywhere, but it's learned behavior. You picked up on your pastor that says, roll around down the aisles, bark like a dog, they call it holy rolling and whatever nonsense goes on. I saw a video of a pastor that ran around the pews like he was circling the diamonds on a baseball field and slid. I'm like, what in the world? People laugh. It was the funniest thing I've seen, but then I started the week. Because what is that man telling his church to do? Don't Live for the hoopla. Don't live for the emotion. They prey on it. Don't live for the, let's get revved up. In here. <laughs> no. Can you just study this? Can we just stay here? This is where it's safe. This is how you grow. But I am tired of hearing, I don't want to study. I don't want to have to put in the work to... I just want to be entertained and spoon-fed and... Hey, I hit my mouth. Yeah, this may offend some of you. But guess what? For every word and every work, we give an account for. And when Jesus says to the guy, the parable of the talents, you wicked and lazy servant, I gave you this and you did nothing with it. Wicked and lazy. That's from the words of Christ. That's not an indictment that we want. I hope not. But the church is at nauseam lazy when it comes to studying the scripture. And you wonder why the nation is going to hell? Do you wonder why the church is going under? Did you know England used to be one of the biggest places where Christianity thrived, missionaries galore, healthy churches everywhere? You know what it is? It's like a graveyard now. And America is headed there fast because the church is under this, I just live off what my pastor gives me. I don't study and really be a disciple. I don't do. Why? What kind of teaching are you listening to? Because pastors everywhere live for that. Fill my seats, put money in the bucket. Do you notice we don't even pass a plate here? I don't want your money. I want you in God's word. I want you to love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Does that sound familiar? I want you to give it your all. For Jesus. Do all for Jesus. Be all for Jesus. That's what we're about here. Anything else? You have a different version of Christianity. One that the Timothy say, it's a form of godliness, but denies its power. In verses 2 and 3 of 1 John chapter 4, here are the troubleshooting results. You're going to find yourself in one of two camps. By this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. It's really simple. There's only two camps, and you're in one or the other. You either believe that Jesus is... Now, what's interesting, when you study church history, many of the cults and false teachings that started in the early church, they had a problem with God being a man. They struggled with his humanity. In fact, there is a cult that started around... Uh, the end of the first century. And they believed that it was an illusion. Jesus wasn't ever really a man. It was an illusion. Because how could God be a, how could God be man? But now we live in the day and age where his deity is under great attack. They got no problem with Jesus being a, a home brother to me, a cool pal, my friend. But is he God? 
is he Lord? That's what's under attack really right now. Can you spiritually diagnose that? Can you take him to the scriptures that prove his deity? Can you? You need to. You need to be able to do it. Where are you? What do you believe? What do you confess? Is Jesus Christ really my God? Am I really born again? Am I really born again? Or am I a Christian that identifies with my denomination, Lutheran, pastor, whatever, or pastor, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, instead of, no, I'm a sold out disciple. I know that I know that I know I'm born again. Because Jesus Christ came and he died. And if he's not fully man, he can't relate to us. And if he's not fully God, then he can't help us. You need both. You should want both. I'm a man and I struggle with manly things. Temptation of the eyes, lust. Listen, before I was a pastor, for a season I struggled in pornography. I'm not ashamed to say it. I struggled with it. I'm a man. There's a lot of temptation. It's disgusting. It's awful. And I abhor it now. But I need Jesus to be able to come to my level and relate to me. Because I need help. And I need him to be God. Because who else is going to take away that sin? Who else can look me in the eyes and say, I love you, son. My blood's got you covered. You're good. I know your heart. You're trying to live for me. I get the struggle. It's real. You see, you need them both. To deny one, you take away who he is. If you take away who he is, I fear for your salvation. And in verses 4 through 6, the last point, we had spiritual troubleshooters, we had troubleshooting results. Simply in 4 verse 6, we have triumph over any trouble. Look in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Take, circle that word overcome. Highlight it. Because it means to subdue, to conquer, to get the victory. If you are of Christ and say you are of God and a true believer, then you will overcome them. Who are them? They're the false teachers. They're the ones that are trying to persuade you to believe something that's not true any way, shape, or form. Why? Because He who is in you, that's the Holy Spirit. So when the people come around and say there's no Trinity, that the Holy Spirit's just a force, He is a personal pronoun. You get that, right? He lives inside of you. He knocks on your heart and says, Yo, Jimbo, I am real. I'm the third person. I'm convicting you of your sin. That person is greater than who is in the world, that Satan, the Antichrist, and everything that would get you to not believe in him. Now listen, this is like a, a household verse. I hear it all the time, greater is he. But then when I watch some people's lives, I wonder if that's really true. If he's really that great, then why are you deliberately living like that? If he's so great, why is it Christians, young Christians, baby Christians, maybe even dried out seasoned saints get swept away by the cults and the false teachings? Why is that? Maybe we didn't troubleshoot like we should have in the very beginning. We didn't take the time to learn and study this. Listen, I, my wife and I were just at the Philadelphia Zoo. They got the J-dubs setting up their tables there. Because they're preaching their version of the gospel using creation as a way in. I'm like, that's a good idea. I need to set up a table over there. I'm going to do that. Next time, I'm going to set up a table right next to them. <laughs> I'll put handcuffs on to make sure that I, hey... We stay calm and we stay cool. I get it. 
And every time they go to their table, I'll be like, uh uh-uh, don't go there. <laughs> Romans 16, 17 and 18. Do you know what that says? Now you do, right? Mark those. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mark them. Mark those because we should be able to overcome. But let me give you a clue to a few of the current false teachings in church today. If you live in the area and you drive on 95, you'll see a big billboard that says, pray for the souls that are in purgatory. Pray for the souls in purgatory. Now, this is a Catholic belief, but they believe if you subscribe to that when you die, you don't go right to the judgment seat. Like the Bible says, it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. They believe, no, you go to this purgatory, a holding cell, where eventually you can get prayed out of. You get a second chance. While that sounds nice, it's heresy. It's false. Scripture absolutely no way supports that position 100% without a doubt. But there's a billboard that's broadcasting this. Oh, so that means I don't need to choose and live for Jesus. That just means I don't need to get saved now because I can do it when I die. No, you can't. You cannot. How about this one? Some churches tell us they have to be water baptized to be saved. You have to be water baptized. Well, I got a problem with that. (laughs) What about the Christians all on their deathbeds? They say in their last minute, they cry out, Lord, save me. (laughs) What, What do you got? Like, then roll them out of their bed and throw them into a pool? I know, let's let them drown. That's how they're going to meet Jesus. You have to be water baptized. What about the thief on the cross? I love asking these questions to these people. I had this conversation. What about the thief? I asked them, did that person go to heaven? You know what they said? No. I hid because I thought lightning was going to strike. I'm like, okay. Ah, but you know what they do? They look in the book of Acts which is where so many churches and pastors go wrong, and they take the scriptures, they see them filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they were baptized. Filled with the Spirit, and then they were baptized. You see, because they were filled with the Spirit, and then they have to be baptized. It has to happen. It's necessary. Is that right? Should you get baptized? Yeah. But is it necessary to your salvation? No. Simple scripture. Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Does it say, oh, and addition, water baptism? But people love to then just, here we go, it's like a spiritual chi cell fight with scriptures. Yeah, but scripture says this. But look at its context. Look at its context. How about this one? Faith and works get you saved. Talking to a really nice, again, Catholic brother who said, yeah, you're not saved by faith alone, it's by works. All right, here we go. Off to the scriptures. Let's talk about it. Ephesians chapter 2. That we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah, but that was, uh, 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 tries to explain it away. I'm like, are you nuts? I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. How can you just deny the scripture? It's so clear. First off, if you say you're saved by works too, how much and how many works? How do you know you did enough? It becomes the scales. I hope I did enough. That's how every other religion lives. I hope I do enough. I hope God will accept me. I hope I can get in. You hope you can get in? You should know you're in. Because you're born in. Here's another one. This is where the liberal church is headed. All paths lead to heaven. Because 
what you wrestle with, well, what about the person who's never heard? I love this. Now, granted, I was told that in the 1040 window over in Asia, there is definitely people who have not been reached yet for the gospel. And in Romans, God says they'll be judged without the law. If they don't know, I ain't going to judge them based on that. Right? Because God is fair. And how he deals with those people is fine. But for those who have heard, you are under obligation to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. But people want to say, well, what about the persecuted areas and Christianity is illegal? Those who are persecuting know exactly what they're doing. Muslims that kill Christians at rapid rate over in the Mideast, they know exactly what they're doing. Yet people are getting saved anyway. Church underground in China, people are getting saved anyway. People in Russia getting saved anyway. Go Google a map and see the persecuted areas and you'll still find churches. How is that? Because God makes a way. Because God is the way through Christ. But don't try to find the man on the island as your excuse to not believe. If you have a burden to find that man, go save him. If you think there's a place and you know of a place where Christians have, or people have not heard the gospel, then I want you to take this Bible and go there since you have a heart for him. Well, why would I want to do that? Because you just told me they're not saved. You said, how can they hear? God wants to send you. <laughs> then they walk out. Yeah, okay. And as I mentioned the one before, and this is where we're going to get ready to close, I want everyone to turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12. Because I will share my most personal experience regarding a false teaching that I possibly can give you. So if you have gotten nothing, if you remember nothing, you can listen to the service. But I want you to listen to Jim's heart on this one. Because if this doesn't wake you up or let you know how bad it can be out there, I'm really not sure what is. Luke chapter 12, is everyone there? Does everyone have their Bible ready? Starting in verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Does everyone know what covetousness is? If you don't, you want something that God hasn't given you because somebody else has. You want to be rich. You want to be famous. You want their stuff. So it's your deep, sinful desire for these things. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness because that's what he's talking about. Inheritance. The guy wants the stuff. And he says this, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to, to them and said, the ground of a certain rich man yieldeth plentifully. And he brought within him, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, What does God say? Fool. Say it again. Fool. Uh, again. Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then those whose will... Then, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. When I was in my Bible college days, your attention please, your attention please, I heard Joel Osteen preach this message. And when he taught it, here's what he said. Number one, he only read verses 16 through 19. Look at those verses. Ground of a rich man yieldeth plentiful. 
thought within himself, what shall I do since I have no room? I will do this, tear down my barns and build a bigger one. And I will say to my soul, you have many goods, later for yours, take, eat, drink, right? He only preached on those verses, family. He left the rest out. And he said this, you just need to have faith and claim it. And God will give you a bigger barn full of more stuff. That was his teaching and his interpretation. And the church <laughs> applauded him. Because no one had their Bibles open. They sat it. They got the hook. Remember the methods? I only say a part of scripture. I take it out of its context. I didn't read before and after. Why do you think I gave you that list? Because that man has deceived many through his teachings to think that you should be Jesus is my genie in the sky, and I get whatever I want, when I want, if I just have faith. It made me so angry. You want to talk about righteous anger? Because you know what I get? Jim, you can't say that about him. Why not? He's my brother in Christ. I should be able to go to my brother if he's offended me. I should be able to go to him if he's teaching something wrong. I should be able to say these things and have the man repent, but they continue to believe what they believe. And not for nothing, but when you have all that and then a news article comes out when the hurricanes hit and you don't open your church to help those who have nothing... That's why you don't believe me. That's why you don't listen to anyone. You test every spirit. I don't care how big the audience is because the majority do it doesn't make it right. Because a lot of people want it to be right doesn't make it right. Because our flesh wants to be rich, famous. Who doesn't? And I'm not condemning you to a life of poverty. No. But I'm telling you, the scripture says, do not pursue after riches. Yes, you have to work. you got to make a living. And usually we do that based upon the things that God puts in our heart to do. Some of you, hey, doctor, lawyer. Some of you, TD bank worker, HR. It's not very thrilling. <laughs> but it pays the bills. It provides. You may not like what you do. Okay, well, okay, you can pray about finding something you do like to do. But I need to say that because you know how many people are lied to on a weekly basis? Because he gets them motivated. Yeah, I'm ready to become rich, famous. I want my yacht. And honestly, when I listened to that message, my whole intent was to see how he put together his outline, his teaching outline. The problem I had was it took him 20 minutes to get to the first scripture. 20 minutes before he even read any scripture. Because it's a repeat cycle. Ready? I keep saying the same thing to you. God wants to bless you. Do you know, brother, you want to be blessed? Hey, brother, man, do you know God's got a blessing for you? Hey, man, and how many times are you going to say that? I got it the first time. God wants to bless me. Great, move on. Teach me something. When you leave your church, do you walk away saying, wow, I learned something? Or do you walk away saying, man, I feel pretty good. Yeah. I'm ready for Monday. Then Monday hits and the crap hits the fan and there's no faith to support and you're like, Aah. but if you learn and grow, God can deal with your fear. If you learn and grow, God can feed you and make you strong, but you got to be in the truth. Some people don't like me because I take the truth and I come right up to your face. <laughs> Here I am. I'm truth. See Can we stand? We're just going to close out in a word of prayer. If you're here today, you've not been born again. Please talk to me after service. I would love to pray with you, give you a copy of the scripture. You can come study with us. Again, since we do it online, that even if you're out of town or just visiting, you can still be part of our study group.
Do you guys want to be a family of God that pinpoints problems? Do you want to go and tell when the Lord opens up a door to say, yo, theology is a little off. Hey, your Christian living is a little off. Hey, can we talk about it from the scriptures? Are we going to purpose to do that, to live like that? Or are we going to just live to ourselves? Paul went to people. The apostles went to people. Are we going to people and talking about what we believe? Why we do what we do? Our grand pursuit of just knowing Christ and making him known. Would you make that honest your prayer today? Make it your prayer. There's a lot of trouble in the church and in the faith family, and I certainly could use your help. Again, hand them my number. Tell them to call me. Come visit me. Tell them to jump online to one of our Facebook devotions. Have them comment to me. Say, yo, I'm that guy. I'm here to challenge you. Okay. Let's go. I'm all for the challenge. I love challenges. Let's step out of our comfort zone, family. I know you know people that aren't saved. I know you may know people that are trapped under some bad theology and ideology. Let's troubleshoot them. Let's help them. And let's see them really either get saved or get out from there so they can really flourish and grow. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this word and this time together. Would you bless our family as we go? Give us a burden, Lord, to help people really study, grow, and know what they believe and why they believe it, God. Father, I pray for the distractions that come upon us on a daily basis that just block you out. Please, God, we want to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and let that be a living reality in our lives starting today. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, Lord, which you give us because you know we fall. You know we fail. We fall short, but you're so good to pick us up. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a blessed day. Enjoy the beautiful day. Copy of my notes, just see me, let me know. I'll be glad to get them to you. Thank you. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. The only one whose favor I see. and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me
Where 